LNG was hardly a widely known term a few years ago when there was no problem with energy in this country. But now that there is a problem, more and more people are learning about LNG, its benefits and its dangers. LNG stands for liquefied natural gas. That's a highly volatile fluid fuel which is transported as a liquid then converted to a gas. It is a useful fuel but a dangerous one and if it's not handled carefully it could cause a catastrophe. Lee McCarthy reports. Boston Harbor. The only things moving are this tanker and its escort. The Coast Guard has banned all other vessels because the tanker is carrying liquid natural gas, the potential for disaster. This is what the Coast Guard is trying to avoid. LNG has spilled, the liquid has vaporized, the vapor has ignited into a fireball. These pictures are from a controlled test, but there are worries that one of these days there will be a similar fire and it won't be a test. The vapor that would be formed from that spilled mater uh, material, uh, if it's ignited, would burn with a very large flame. Just the heat from that flame alone could cause injury to people, burns, and could even ignite houses uh, up to distances like a mile away. Uh, if the material isn't ignited right away but drifts ashore, then the effects would be even more harmful because then there would be people enveloped by a burning cloud. The only time that happened in this country was in Cleveland in 1944. An LNG storage tank ruptured. The liquid leaked out and vaporized. The fire that followed killed 128 people. It was a severe blow to the LNG industry, which didn't recover until research developed new storage materials and until the energy shortage led to new demands for LNG. The industry claims that the chance of another disaster is remote. We've reduced the risk to so small a figure that it's practically impossible to calculate it. The fact is that anything we do in this world has some risk associated with it, clearly. The ceiling right up here could fall on our heads. There's some chance of that. However, we feel that we've done a good job of minimizing that risk, getting it down practically to zero. The demand for LNG has led to demand for super tankers to carry it and for terminals where it can be unloaded and stored. Sixteen tankers worth two billion dollars have been ordered from American shipyards. They will have double hulls, which are supposed to make them almost spill-proof if there is an accident. The Boston Terminal is the only one now operating in this country. Three other terminals have been built but are not yet operating. The Federal Power Commission is considering applications for five other terminals. The Commission is expected to approve most of the applications. Some of the proposed sites are in or near major population centers. Critics say if there must be terminals, they should be put in remote areas. They say the Boston Terminal is a perfect example of where a terminal should not be. It sits in a crowded area next to a cluster of oil storage tanks. We live in fear. We really do, everybody, and that's why a lot of people say, hey, look, when I told the people in that area, if this is really true, well, we're going to get out of here, and you can't blame them. And this is what we're trying to keep our community together and keep them here. But all these dangerous things going on, I don't know. A report done for the Federal Power Commission estimates that more than 800,000 people live within the risk area of an LNG tanker accident in New York Harbor. But the agency says the odds of a serious accident happening anywhere are 10,000 to 1. The critics say those odds are not long enough. Well, the chance is small. Uh, but the chance of other major accidents, such as an airplane falling out of the sky into a, a city, is also small. Nevertheless, we have to be prepared for dealing with the consequences of such an accident, should it ever happen. Now, I can give you no end of studies and analysis and so forth that, uh, that uh, prove my point. But I think the best demonstration is the fact that we're all right here in this terminal who's worried. Some scientists are worried, and some people who live near proposed LNG terminals are worried. But they concede that LNG is here to stay, that there will be more tankers and more terminals. They say that at the very least, the terminals should be built in remote areas, far from population centers. And they continue to ask the question, do the benefits outweigh the risks? 
Lee McCarthy, NBC News, Boston. gather today to pay and do enjoy the veterans have guarded and helped to preserve. May we be There are more than 29 million veterans today in the United States. And here in Alabama today, we have 430,000 veterans. And of course, we are here today to pay tribute a special tribute to those who are not here. We will show our appreciation for the protection of our heritage by maintaining our will, courage, and strength necessary to keep this country free. We first had a uh, had a armed robbery of the KO station on uh, North Court Street. Uh, in route to this uh, call, uh, Officer Milam, who is a motorman, spotted a car on the interstate on I-65 headed south at a high rate of speed. He pursued this vehicle, and uh, when it's when he got it stopped, uh, the uh, one of the black males. There were two in the car. One of the black males in the car opened fire on him, hitting him, hitting his helmet. Um, he was not injured. Uh, only a, he claims to only have a headache. Um, at this point, he called in for assistance. Uh, one of the west side cars uh, picked his car up and pursued it to the corner of uh, Alamo and uh, Mill Street, the extreme end, west end of Mill Street at which time the two black males abandoned the vehicle and ran into a wooded area. And uh, the car is being processed by our ID people at this time. We can hear the helicopter overhead right now. Uh, is there other units in the field right now? Yes, this, this whole area is surrounded, uh, and the, uh, our tracking dog is now uh, trying to uh, pick up a track from the car to the, into the wooded area and the state trooper helicopter standing by in case he picks up a track. Britain study. Mr. Connors? No.
have any idea what caused the derailment? Well, they're still being investigated at this time. How long do you think it will be before you have this cleaned up? Well, we're going to run trains by 6 p.m. tonight, by here, by the scene. Uh, this is fortunate in the fact that there are two tracks here. No, uh, we've got a siding, but it was uh, blocked also. But we're going to set the cars aside and then uh, come back uh, possibly the Monday after Thanksgiving and pick the cars up at that time. You responded rather quickly. Where did you have to come from to get this uh, cleanup equipment into place? Well, we were at Pelham, Alabama. Came from Pelham back down here. And then, of course, the wrecker that's working on that end came from Atlanta. Is this uh, a common occurrence with this particular section of track? No, not too terribly bad. We, of course, have had a uh, few accidents, but minor. Although the workmen are almost uh, through clearing the tracks here, Environmental Protection Agency officials will be monitoring the water supply of the city of Talladega to make sure that none of the chemicals which were dumped into the small creek here today make their way into the city's water supply. This is Bob Howell, WSFA TV News in Clay County, Alabama. Hold that off until we get some further information. Put it right in, Mr. Miller. Oh, 78 percent. Not sure in August was a typical month to use as a base, but the test period I thought was very long. That was reduced to 106 for a reduction of 31 percent. That's during the fifth one that we can deal effectively. It'll have to be advertised by the city county personnel board. A citizen screening committee will have to be established of citizens to screen the applicants. A number of those applicants, I do not know that number, whether it's three or five or whatever they want to recommend, they will recommend to the board. And from those recommendations, the board has final approval of a chief executive officer. Put that out Mr. Miller. We need uh, Chief, what is the status of your current police communication system? Is it doing the job that it needs to be doing? Uh, absolutely not, Bill, and we're in the process now of replacing the, the total system. We have a VHF system right now, and we're replacing it with a UHF system. The mayor has approved funding and uh, through LEAA grants. We are now in the process. We've already uh, taken delivery of the walkie-talkies, the mobile units, and we're now ready, waiting for the console unit and we hope to be in business in about 30 to 60 days. Is this going to fit in with the recommendations of the Quintam report? Yes, it is. This is, uh, this is the recommendations, part of them, of the Quintam report. What will this system be able to do that your current one doesn't do? Well, as you know, uh, we have a 200 square miles that we cover in the police jurisdiction. We can now talk about six to eight blocks with a handy talk in maybe a mile, a mile and a half with a, a mobile unit, car to car. With the new UHF system, we'll be able to talk countywide from walkie-talkie to walkie-talkie with a repeater system of uh, antennas throughout the city. Will you be able to um, do something about congestion on your two-way lines? Yes, it'll be a four-channel operation as we have now. Uh, we'll, we'll split it on two, uh, two operations per channel and uh, work it that way. We'll have two operators on all time, at all times.
The 16th Street Baptist Church was the staging area for most of the civil rights marches and demonstrations that took place in Birmingham in 1963. Martin Luther King Jr. was about to demonstrate the effectiveness of nonviolent confrontations, and much of the training in nonviolence was done in the 16th Street Church. On Sunday morning, September 15, 1963, a bomb went off at the church. Four young girls were killed. A few weeks later, this man, Robert Chambliss, was arrested and charged with illegal possession of dynamite. Now, 14 years later, Chambliss has been charged with the murder of the four girls. He's 73 years old. The Alabama Attorney General has said there really isn't much new evidence in the case, that 14 years ago there was very little cooperation among federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies but that he's put all that evidence together now. Well, then that plus the change in the uh, climate in Alabama where we did have uh, some witnesses back then that were hesitant uh, about talking uh, out of fear, and, uh, and that's no longer true. Robert Chambliss will be tried for the murder of only one of the four girls, Denise McNair. He's entered a plea of not guilty. And his attorney says he believes he can convince the jury that Chambliss is, in fact, not guilty. This case is not political. This case is not racial. This case has only one question, whether the one 73-year-old man did or did not commit the crime charge. statements on human rights and the pressure <coughs> that he's brought on the question of human rights has affected uh, religion either way in the Soviet Union. Has it made your job more difficult? On our two guests, if you do not, here is one, please. That is the Secretary of the All-Union Council of our citizens for uh, baptisms, baptismal doctrines. And, uh, of course, I do cannot say that it has done purposely but uh, in many cases, it's done like this, that this, this is the only case, and, and nothing... ...may could be out now, but he chooses not to do some things to be out of prison. My meal, what I eat, <laughs> and so on. <laughs> and second, uh, we, of course, uh, give uh, our reports to our presidio, our elected bodies, which send us, which pay money for our authorities. And usually we have, we've never been uh, at, at rejected. All, always we've been granted. And when there is uh, some conferences,
because there's so many different reasons, but if I had to just make, make a guess, I'd have to say that people just put it off. What's the penalty for not having your tag bought on time? For an automobile, it's $1.95. For trucks and larger vehicles, it's 15% of the price of the automobile tag, or the truck tag, or whatever other vehicle it might be. What do you think the lines are going to be like the rest of this week? Oh, we'll have lines uh, the next three days of this week. If, if our past uh, uh, seasons or any representation of this year, we'll still have lines through Friday. NBC called you. Montgomery's not exactly blessed with a nice grid street layout. In fact, we're cursed in one respect. Sometimes I wonder how the streets did develop in the manner we see them today. Believe you me, it gives us a headache every day, the street pattern we have here. It's unlike anything I've ever seen in, in the whole country. As traffic engineer in the city of Montgomery, what do you see as the city's major traffic problem? Dave, our problem primarily is one of street capacity. We simply do not have the street width or the proper block lengths in order to properly move traffic in Montgomery efficiently. This can be translated very briefly into terms of money and finances, and that in summary is our problem. What, just not enough money to, to correct the situation? That's true, there's not enough money. I think I could safely say if we had the funds available, we could rapidly clear up all of Montgomery's traffic problems, practically overnight. Have you approached the city about getting more money? Well, Mayor Farmer is quite cognizant of the traffic problem, and he's every day doing something to alleviate it, and as money becomes available, he's putting it into use. I feel very encouraged about it. What are some of the major problem areas in the town, say a certain street or a certain intersection, that you think needs immediate uh, help? Our primary problem right now is in East Montgomery, particularly as you go out towards the new mall in that direction. There's a great large number of growth and development out there. And frankly, I don't know which way to turn at this point. It's just oversaturated. So you think the bypass needs to be widened? Would that solve all the problems, or would that just be a beginning? I think grade separations or interchanges, which you choose to call them, is going to be the answer out there ultimately. And there are plans in the making to do this, along with making the service drives one way, which would be the ultimate solution to the southern and eastern bypass. Interchanges, you mean like you have on the interstates? Yes, similar to that. Clover lease, whatever you choose to call them. For every intersection on the bypass? For every intersection. That's going to be the only solution in the long run. Is that in a definite planning stage, or is that just speculation right now? Well, it's planned. Again, it boils down to what funds are available. This will be a joint effort with the State Highway Department. And how long before you think you could realize that? I wouldn't predict a date at this time. It's been in planning stage five or six years now. What about the places, one place in particular that I can think of is at Court Street in Fairview, where you're going south on one way, and then right after you pass Fairview, you go to two-way. That causes some, a lot of congestion sometimes and some problems. Is there any way to reconcile that at all? Well, again, that boils down to need to alter in your street design, street widths, the geometrics of the intersections, and that type of thing, which I hate to say, but again, goes right back to your finance problem. The streets do weird things sometimes. Sometimes you'll be on a four-lane road and all of a sudden you go down to three lanes. Why is that? Well, there's certain measures we can take. We do a few things like uh, reversible lane lights, one-way streets, this type of thing, uh, that we can do up to a point. After that, it becomes a, a problem of needing to widen the street to pick up the capacity, which I mentioned previously. Do you see a time when all the streets in Montgomery could be, or not all of them, but a majority of them be one way just to help traffic flow? I think so, and I think that would be a very big improvement in Montgomery. While the streets are wide, primarily downtown, the crux of the matter comes in the length of the blocks, and that's where we can improve our signal timing with one-way streets as contrasted to the two-way movement we have in this obsolete system downtown today. Do you see that the population of Montgomery is growing faster than you can accommodate it with the city streets? Very definitely faster than the city street system. Uh, we haven't actually changed the street system, and 
primarily, and I guess, in 50 years. We're still stuck with it, and it just doesn't come up to meet today's demands of traffic flow. Sugarcane farmers in the southeast say they can no longer stay in business. They claim they can't break even in today's wholesale market, and many say they'll be forced to quit by the end of the year. The Carter administration is giving farmers higher price supports. Under the program, farmers will be guaranteed 13.5 cents per a pound of sugar. That's 2.5 cents more than they get now. But some of them say even that won't be enough. The industry would need at least 17 to 17 and a half cents to have a reasonable profit. Because at 16 cents, we'd be in the business for sentiment. And sentiment does not pay bills, nor does sentiment give us the things of life that every American is entitled to. I don't think anyone is better off than me. They couldn't do uh, much better in uh, production at that price. Because the cost of producing a ton of cane is right around 16 to $18 right now. So if I can't do it, I know uh, no one else could do it. Farmers say prices are low because the government permits too much cheap foreign sugar into this country. Farmers want the government to impose quotas. Instead, the Carter administration has increased import tariffs. Farmers say that isn't enough either. Consumers can now expect to pay more for sugar at the supermarket. Price supports alone are expected to drive sugar up three cents a pound. Bob Jimenez, NBC News, St. James Parish, Louisiana. Linda, Linda, God, you said that right. I, I would, I would answer. Oh, I don't want this. I don't want this to show. Oh, do we? Okay. Do we want eagle form? Oh, I don't know. I'm proud of it. Well, I am too. But to say that we're all eagle form, which we're not. Okay. They make it. Yeah. This it might be. See, I don't know why I couldn't use his, but I. Mm -hmm. Well, Charlena. <coughs> From the reception that you're getting or the information you get out of the conference, do you feel that uh, you are very, really being discriminated against? Definitely do. I really do. I, the rules that they've made and have sent us, it seems to me like that they are just all against everything that we could possibly do. I mean, it's cut and dried. Here is our plan of action, and you like it or you don't like it. We don't expect to have too much to be able to say about it. You don't feel like things are going to be conducted in a democratic way at the conference? Well, um, it wasn't here at the Alabama conference, and I don't know why they would change. It wasn't in a lot of the conferences. Church of Christ had to pay for You're not doing that. I hope. Well, wait, I think, uh, you have to, uh, <laughs> the church has a lot of money. Yeah. Church of Christ in Huntsville said we won't be outdone, so he chartered it for 10 well, thousand. Well, it's more in contrast to the IWI. Mm -hmm. um, they are sending recommendations and resolutions to the president, uh, which we oppose. And our resolutions um, will tell the president and the Congress how we feel about these things. We are going at our own expense. Uh, the convention is a federally financed uh, convention, and they don't speak. We don't feel that they speak for the majority of Americans, and we want our voices to be heard. When you say these things, could you pinpoint those for me? Uh, they are asking uh, for abortion on demand, uh, federally funded daycare centers, 
uh, rights for homosexuals and prostitutes, and a high priority is uh, ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. And these are a few that I feel very strongly about. Oh, the ERA is always going to be a main objective, whether it's ratified or unratified. As long as women are still oppressed and our, the reality of our lives continues to be the way it is, equal rights for women is going to go on forever. Do you really feel women are oppressed? Oh, most definitely I feel that women are oppressed. It's obvious everywhere you go. I understand uh, you passed a resolution in your convention on battered women. Yes, we did. We had a, a resolution. Uh, Concerning battered women, it's, a, it's really a pitiful situation because in Montgomery alone, in September last month, uh, well, month four last, there were over 258 battered women that were reported to the mental health authorities. And if you don't think that's an issue, then there never has been an issue for a woman to be beaten and beaten and beaten and nothing can be done about it, where there are laws that are protective to uh, other people, other children, child abuse laws and things like that, but there are no laws of uh, protecting uh, uh, the wives. It seemed that a lot in your convention was aimed at the homemaker. Is that something, are homemakers supporting the ERA? Oh, definitely. We are certainly supportive of homemakers, and I hope homemakers are supportive of the ERA because I think the ERA is going to be the one thing that will enable the homemaker to uh, uh, have their uh, contributions to the home valued in a manner that they will also have retirement. They will have uh, other benefits that people have that are working to make an er, a earning, uh, sorry, earning a living wage. Of course, this will probably come through Social Security as soon as we get the discrimination out of everything. I have been, uh, uh, as you say, totally committed to football ever since I can remember, and this is the first fall that I've ever had where I had the weekends that uh, I didn't have anything to do. I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, having some weekends and being able to go to Florida one weekend and going dove hunting on opening day and watching a few football games. You know, one of the greatest parts of the game is watching the bands play, which I never did get to see. And uh, spending some time, I've watched all of my little, I have two boys, Pat and Mike, and they both play football and uh, for the community here and have had a chance to see them play. So it's been a good experience for me and it's been uh, uh, great to be able to look at it uh, and join the ranks of the experts up in the stand. I am surprised that those individuals were not indicted by the federal grand jury, and I'm surprised that they are not now serving in the federal penitentiary, as they should be. And the governor of this state gives an order to the state adjutant general to reinstate these individuals. And in my opinion, Governor Wallace should be ashamed and he should hold his head in disgrace. And I don't like it, I resent it. I have made a request <coughs> to the Secretary of the Army, Clifford Alexander, for an appointment. I'm gonna go to Washington to sit down with Mr. Alexander, the Secretary of the Army, in regards to the possibility of getting those individuals federal recognition taken. It is obvious that Governor Wallace, the Commander-in-Chief of the Alabama National Guard, is not going to do anything about the corruption in this uh, state that exists with the Alabama National Guard.
Them girls, get it out, John, and down. Yeah, Can I get, get one more picture? <coughs> Mac, how are you? You're doing fine, Governor. Bill, keep on. Jerry, come on in a little closer, will you? about that? That's good. That's good. <laughs> Charlie, yes. get one of my boys now to get this and get them girls, get it out, John, and down. A trophy and a check for $3,000 to each of the 1977 winners. Jack O'Rourke, NBC News, New York. 90 miles an hour, second serve. Right now, his biggest concern is his garden. It hasn't been one of his better years. He spends a lot of time gardening, that is, when he's not down at the office. Five, sometimes six days a week, the judge, as he's nicknamed, can be found at his law firm. At 101, it's reported that he's the oldest practicing barrister in the state of Texas, as well as America. The judge says that back in the good old days, before 1918, they used to only pick businessmen for juries. He wishes they still did it that way. Why, well, of course, you get better type jurors, intelligent, more intelligent, and anyone, men that have had experience, uh, business experience, why they are more competent to pass on questions that are submitted to them. Why do you keep working? That's just because I, I prefer it. That's all. I enjoy it. I'd rather come down here to the office in the morning and if I have, I don't care if I, how much business I have, the more the better. And I, that's, or that's my pleasure. Judge Fish says he doesn't smoke or drink and clean living has probably helped him reach 101. His dad lived to be 98. His uncle died at 89. He says they were old soldiers, though, from the Civil War. This is Dan Royal reporting from Amarillo, Texas. We're going to include a 30-second commercial at this time, and we will feed this 30-second commercial uh, twice.